um, and try and find better ways of doing things. Just building the suspense. Uh, with this project, I'm also working with Sue Hatcher, who's here in the front row, and she's speaking today as well. Um, so any curly questions, they can all go straight to Sue. Uh, we're also collaborating with Merino Link. Um, they've got a great network of producers involved in that association, and um, there's quite a few people interested in the outcomes of this project. So the, the title of the project is Pregnancy Scanning in Extensive Sheep Flocks. And by extensive, we really mean, you know, large scale, um, relatively low stocking rates, like big areas. So the real aim of this project is to increase the net reproduction rate on these properties, and that just means increasing the number of lambs weaned per use joint. Um, we're focusing on the Western and Riverina districts of New South Wales, because traditionally, I think these areas might have been a bit left out in some other um, research projects. And this PDS is going to be running for three years so that we can capture two full breeding cycles and hopefully capture a lot of data with that over that time. So with support from the project team, this is really a, a producer-led program. So the producers on our demonstration sites are going to be taking various um, strategies, management strategies like preg scanning and applying that to their own flocks. And the project team is going to be there to help support them in that with training, mentoring and, and problem solving as well. Um, we'll also be collecting data through a pretty thorough benchmarking process across the two breeding cycles uh, to really evaluate the success of what we're doing and make sure that it's, you know, there's a real economical benefit to doing that as well. So we've got five demonstration sites. Um, there are a few around Hay, uh, one north of Wentworth, and the most northern site is up near Wilcannia. So a pretty good spread and a couple of different environments there. All of these properties run Merino U's and they join anywhere between November and March. Uh, most of them are around December. So each of the flocks, uh, sorry, each of the sites are going to be applying these flock management techniques to a mob of at least 500 U's. So we've got enough numbers there to really get an impact. Um, some will also be applying it to a whole age group. Some of these sites, they are already doing a bit of bit of preg scanning. Um, it might only be wet and drying opportunistically, depending on the season. Others are um, scanning for singles and twins and managing differentially based on that. So we've got a pretty broad range in what people are already doing. So with these flock management techniques I'm talking about, we're really targeting all those different key stages of the reproduction cycle um, because we know that managing the ewe throughout that time is going to have a really big impact on the developing lamb. So we know that ewe condition in the lead up to, um, to joining is going to have a big impact on whether she can conceive at all, but also the number of eggs that she releases. I wonder if this works. There we go. Um, when we're looking at early pregnancy, that's really quite important for developing that placenta. And if you've got any nutritional restrictions at this time, that can affect the fetal growth in the last half of pregnancy. When we're talking about late pregnancy, that's really talking about day 90 up to lambing, and that's where the majority of the fetal growth occurs. Um, nutritional restrictions at this time will have a massive impact on that lamb birth weight, and ultimately survival. Birth weight's a really big factor for survival. We also need, need to think about the um, follicle development. So if you've got nutritional restrictions at that time, that's gonna impact on the lifetime production of that lamb in terms of its fleece weight and the quality. Once the lambs are born, um, really we need to think about getting those lambs growing as quickly as possible because we know every kilo heavier they are at weaning is going to be improving their, their survival from weaning onwards as well. And another factor is looking at ewe mortality. So ewes are often very sensitive to um, changes in their diet in late pregnancy and, and early lambing and that's where you get a lot of ewe deaths happening. So that's another factor we'll be working on as well. So past research has shown that we can target these different areas to improve reproduction, but this PDS is really about working out how they best fit into an extensive sheep system. Um, it's also to feed that, what information we get back from our producers, feed that back to MLA so we can inform future projects as well. So starting with joining, we're going to be looking at optimising joining length, um, mob size, the ram joining percentage and paddock size. And when I'm talking about optimise, 
it's really with the resources we've got and the system we've got, how can we find a solution that is most practical and gets the best benefit for the extra work that's involved? It's not always about reaching the maximum, it's finding something that's sustainable long term. So if we're looking at um, joining length, as just one example of one of the things we're, we're going to be trying. We know that if you're joining ewes after January and they're in reasonable conditions, so say condition score three and above, you should have about 95% of your ewes conceiving within the first two cycles, so that's 34 days. Um, a couple of things that will go into that will be you know, the time of year and obviously the condition that the ewes are in. So conversation we'll be having with our producers is if you join for longer, yes, you'll probably get a few extra lambs, but is that worthwhile when you think about um, the impact that those late lambs have on your operations like marking and weaning? Is it actually better to have a shorter, tighter um, lambing so you could do those marking and weaning operations in a really timely manner, or are those extra lambs really important to your business? Ultimately, what will happen will depend on the producer, um, and what works for one may not work for another. In mid-pregnancy, we're going to be um, scanning for dry singles and twin-bearing ewes, and in flocks that do join for a longer period of time, we'll also scan for early and late lambs, so we can manage them accordingly. Uh, the twins are going to be managed separately, so we can really focus on their nutritional needs. Um, and I think, just in general, there are a few really good reasons to pregnancy scan. So even if you're just scanning for wet and dry, um, and you might do this opportunistically, but you can use that information to immediately have a big impact on your flock reproduction rate um, just by selecting out those non-productive ewes. So I think most people, you know, in a tight year, you'd, you'd cull the dries, so you've got less mouths to feed. Um, but even in good years, it can be really worthwhile recording that information because if a ewe scans dry twice as a two and a three-year-old, for the rest of her lifetime as a four, five and six-year-old, she's actually only going to fall pregnant about half, half the time. So one year she might fall pregnant, the following year she'll be dry again. When you compare that to a ewe that scans pregnant twice as a two and a three-year-old, she will actually fall pregnant 80% of the time. So these are repeat offenders, and if you can pick them up early, you're not carrying those passengers for the rest of their life. Um, scanning for litter size and then differentially managing those ewes based on the result will give you even more benefit um, because you can start impacting on some of those developmental processes that we talked about before. One of the things I get really excited about and I bang on about a fair bit is twin lamb survival um, because at the moment about on average maybe 60-65% of twin lambs actually make it to marking. So if you think about that, that's an enormous loss. Um, and, and we often don't see it in the paddock. You get your numbers back at marking and you go, oh yeah, 120%, not too bad, but um, I think it's a massive opportunity that, that we can all work on as an industry. Um, and just having a look at this quick chart, even something as simple as ewe condition score can have a massive impact on lamb survival. So we've got condition score along the bottom there and lamb survival on the vertical axis. And Basically, every extra little bit of condition that you can put on that U has a dramatic impact on survival. So it's really well worth doing things like that where you can. So the scanning information that we'll get will also be used to basically allocate U's to paddocks um, based on their nutritional needs and their um, preg status, as well as to try and manage mob size as much as possible. Mm -hmm. There's been some great research from WA recently which has been looking at uh, mob size at lambing time and the impact on survival. And they've worked out that if you can reduce mob size by 100 ewes, that can improve survival for singles by up to 0.8%. So not massive, but something there. Um, but for twins, this is again the real opportunity. You can improve survival by up to 3.5% just by reducing your mob sizes. So if you had a, a mob of 800 ewes, if you can at least split them in half, um, you know, you could potentially end up with another 50, 50 to 100 lambs surviving just, just by splitting them in half. Now obviously the, the response is going to be quite different depending on your flock, but I think it's worth asking the question and looking into. So at marking time, um, the ewes that have scanned pregnant but have failed to rear a lamb will be recorded because, like I mentioned with the preg scanning, these girls are repeat offenders and we don't want them. 
So this is a little bit different to the first table we looked at that was in green, um, but now we're looking at ewes that have been scanned, oh, sorry, that have um, lambed down, but they have lost a lamb before marking. So if she does that two years in a row, as a two and a three year old, she's only gonna, again, rear a lamb, maybe one every two years, compared to a ewe that does manage to successfully rear a lamb as a two and a three year old, she'll go on to nearly have a lamb every year. So I know what ewes I would prefer to have on my property. It's also a pretty simple technique. Um, even if you don't scan, just wet and drying a marking picks up a lot of this information. It's pretty powerful stuff. Um, the other thing we need to be planning for at marking time is also getting those lamb growth rates up. Like I mentioned before, the more kilos you can have on at weaning time, the better the survival. So this is looking at a live weight at weaning and a weaner survival for, let's say, a 45 kilo mature ewe. The higher, you know, the heavier your ewes are, the higher these targets need to be. But having a look at this, you can see that about 20 kilos, you should have about 95% weaner survival. But if you're lighter than that, then it really affects the chances of those, weaning, of those weaners making it through to 12 months of age. Um, finally, we'll get to weaning. So this will be a really good chance to just get all the numbers together and review the outcomes. Um, from that point, the ewes are going to be run as per normal practice for the farm. Um, but we'll sit down and really talk about well, what, what worked, what are some of the early numbers we're getting out, and what should we try again next year. We'll also be using EID tags um, where on the properties that, that that's feasible, so we can collect really good individual data, condition scores and, and things like that to better inform our decisions for next year as well. Now I know there are going to be some challenges we'll come up against, um, I'm pretty realistic about that, um, but I've no doubt the people that we're working with that we're going to come up with some pretty good solutions as well. Paddock size is obviously a really big one. Um, Homey a carton, wine's also good. Um, look, I know the, the cost of fencing and water infrastructure is, is not cheap. Um, talking to Stacey at dinner last night, it's, yeah, it's, it's massive. Um, also, you know, there's a challenge of, of land clearing or even just, just, yeah, the feasibility, the practicality of getting those systems in there. So if we're not able to subdivide paddocks to, you know, help reduce mob size, some of the things we might be looking at is, well, what temporary fencing options do we have? Can we put in really cheap plain wire fencing? Can we do electric fencing? Um, what, what other things can we try? Um, if we're not able to do any fencing at all, it might just be looking at putting in additional water sources so that we can adjust grazing pressure on the paddock and actually utilise more of the pasture that is there. Um, with mob sizes, a lot of users run in age groups, so we'll be looking at what opportunities are there to maybe box mobs so that we can run them based on nutritional needs um, rather than just, just by age group. Another big challenge is going to be being able to apply that differential management in the first place. So with big paddock sizes, you know, there may not be very much difference between one and the other, so we can't really apply that targeted nutrition that we want to, and that'll be very seasonally dependent. So there'll be a bit of a wait and see approach there. Another one will be um, handling frequency. So we do want to do a fair bit of monitoring in this project because if you're not measuring something, you can't manage it and you can't evaluate how effective it is. Um, but you know, obviously getting a mob in is, is not a simple task. Um, preg scanning might only take half a day, but we've got to think about the time involved in, in getting those sheep into the yards and then back out to their paddock too. Um, the extra level of manage management that we're talking about, it, it is going to take some time. So um, we want to make sure that you know, we're, we're getting all that data together so we can decide, is it even economical to do this? So we're going to be recording um, labour, labour information as well. So with that benchmarking process, just to give you an idea of some of the data we're collecting, really looking at U numbers, LAM numbers, doing a lot of condition scoring at different times, um, RAM joining percentage, information on, on mob sizes, paddock sizes, um, of course, all our scanning information. Um, at marking, we'll do some key fitness indicators as well. So as well as our udder assessments, we're looking at whether they've got teeth, um, they can walk around, um, all those important things for raising a lamb. And I think really 
having good data is really powerful because you've got to know, with re repro in, partic in particular, there are so many different factors, different variables. You've got to have good data to know which ones you actually need to focus your efforts on. Because um, it could be condition score, it could be, you know, feed in the paddock, who knows. With the rough timeline we're working on, um, so we'll hopefully begin benchmarking with our properties next month. Um, breeding will, well, the breeding cycle will start in November, December and March. And in terms of getting other people involved, we're wanting to hold a couple of webinars um, every year just to really talk through some of those challenges with our core producers on the demonstration sites, um, see what solutions they're finding, and um, yeah, invite others to participate as well. We'll also make sure we're having at least a, you know, a field day a year coming along to an event like this, just so we can give everyone an update on what's happening. And everything should wrap up by May 2024, all going well, with um, pretty, hopefully a pretty decent report and um, some case studies as well. So for others that might want to be involved, we do have um, what's called observer producers. So observer producers really just get to officially look over the shoulder of the core producers and see what's happening. Um, you know, take bits and pieces out of this project and see what might work for you. There's no requirement to actually do anything with your own flock. It's just a really good opportunity to see. Um, yeah, if you've ever been curious about some of the things I've talked about, it's a good opportunity to see them put into practice um, and, and learn from everyone else that's having a go too. So as an observer, um, you'll be able to come along to the webinars with the core producers, and that is um, a closed event, so it's not necessarily open to the public. Um, you'll be able to connect with myself and Sue, so if you've got any little things you're trying yourself, you know, we're happy to do some um, yeah, problem solving with you there. Um, but keep in mind, it is first in best dressed. We can only have a certain number of, of producers. Um, so if you might be keen, have a chat to either me or Sue today and we'll get your name down. So thank you. Um, any questions, I'll be happy to. Thanks. We're on. Um, so what kind of data program would you recommend for producers to use to collect like large amounts of data and analyze it as well? So what kind of program? Yep, so you're thinking of, of individual animal data using yeah. EIDs? Yep. Um, look, there are a few out there. I, I do a lot of my sort of work just in Excel. So if you're handy with Excel, that, that does it for most things. Um, but there are other, other ones like Stockbook, Sapien. Um, they're pretty good too. But Excel gets you a long way and it's free. So. Um, in the future, do you see yourself doing a similar practice like this in other regions of Australia to see how it varies throughout, or just in Hay? At the moment, we're just um, focusing on this project, but, but the techniques I've been talking about, I work with my clients on that every day um, and, and see good results from doing that. It's obviously a very different environment where I'm from, though, in Cootamundra. Um, you know, some farms might only be a couple thousand hectares, and that's a pretty good farm from where I'm from. <laughs> and here, I know it's a very different story. So. Yeah, but there are lots of other consultants like me too that are doing exactly the same thing with their private clients. Hi, just over here. Um, with your data collection, are you collecting baseline data and then other information with those management changes to measure the, the change? Yes, we will. And the, the approach will vary depending on on um, the individual property. So for some people, um, they might want to try these flock management techniques on the whole farm. Sorry, if you can see me. Um, in which case, we'll look at historical data as our baseline. So, you know, the last five years, ideally. Um, for other properties that just want to trial it on a smaller mob of, you know, maybe that trial mob of 500, we will use other flocks, other mobs on that property as our comparison. <laughs> Uh, earlier in the presentation when you were talking about uh, reducing the mob size, um, decreasing it by 100 ewes, um, increase the survival rate uh, quite significantly of the lambs, um, what would you believe that would come down to? Is that something to do with the merinos and the maternal status or is it just a better nutritional plane uh, with those smaller mob sizes? 
Um, from my understanding, I'm certainly not an expert, um, but I believe it's, it's all about the number of lambs hitting the ground on any given day and, and potentially the confusion that causes and the potential for, for lambs just getting lost. Um, they, in that research, they also looked at, at stocking rate effects, but it doesn't appear that stocking rate has as much of an impact. Um, largely, uh, talking with the researchers, I think because sheep just hang out together anyway. So regardless of your stocking rate, if you've got a mob of you know, 400, that's a lot of sheep in one relatively small area to be lambing down at once. And you know, sheep aren't that smart, so <laughs> they tend to lose lambs pretty easily. Okay, looks like one Just more, one David, over here. Um, you had the, the program of uh, scanning, joining, all that. You didn't have shearing in there. Um, where does shearing fit into pre-lambing or after? Maybe. So um, all the normal operations like shearing is, is completely up to the producers. We won't be asking them to change any of that, but we will be recording uh, when those events are happening, um, also to see if there's an impact there. Is that your...? Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be an interesting program for you. I don't think you're anywhere near getting what you're really looking for. You've got a long way to go. How do you mean? There's a whole heap of things that you haven't even considered. And um, you're in the rangelands now, going to be extensive rangelands, big paddocks, and um, there's a massive amount of work to do just on getting those mobs smaller. Um, I think our mobs are probably um, around 100 to 150 now and um, not scanning. So we moved past the scanning thing to uh, back to the joining part and the whole weaning thing. So programs is, and it all works. So the result, we've got better results than you'll ever come up with. And we're already doing it. So what I might do at this point David and Barbara, if you're happy, is are you able to have a quick discussion with Laura and Sue during the Smoko break? Because we're just about to break for Smoko. Yep. Are you okay with that? Laura? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Because yeah. this is, I just want to reiterate, this is a, a learning process. I mean, we know there are people that are doing things, but the point of this is really to, to document it so that it can be out there for everyone to see and, and really try and quantify, you know, what works and what doesn't for these different demonstration sites. Um, and yeah, I'd love to talk to you guys about your experience too, because yep, we can that's, all learn that's a lot good. from it. So if that's okay, we might break for Smoko now um, and, uh, and resume at 10.30. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura.